On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have a fantastic panel. We have Mr. Curtis Franklin and Mr. Oliver Riss on the show today. They may have heard what's going on in Eastern Europe, but what you may have not heard is about the cyber warfare that's going on over there. We'll definitely talk about that. Plus, quantum computing promises to help businesses solve problems that are beyond the reach of the conventional computer today. Today, we have Scott Buckholz. He's quantum leader for Deloitte. We're going to talk about the trends we are seeing and the practical applications for this advanced technology. You definitely should not miss that. Twyla on the set podcasts you love from people you trust this is twit this is twyatt this week in enterprise tech episode 482 recorded february 25th 2022 nefarious deed doers this episode of this week in enterprise tech is brought to you by Linode. Develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and easier. Get $100 in credit. Visit linode.com slash twiet. And by HackerRank. It's time to reboot your technical interviews with HackerRank's easy-to-use tools. With a pre-made question library, code playback, and built-in whiteboard, you'll be conducting better technical interviews and instantly identifying the right talent. Go to hackerrank.com slash twiet. Start a better tech interview for free today. And by Thinks Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tool slash twit and enter the code twit and the hattie here about us box. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I am your host, Louis Moreska, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. But I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field. And today we have our longtime friend of the show and our favorite business technology journalist and editor. He's the executive editor at PC Mag. He's Mr. Oliver Rist. Oliver, welcome back to the show. How are you been? I've been okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, Enjoy the opportunity to snark some more. Fantastic, fantastic. Now you, uh, you know, you're you're on the East Coast here, over in New England area. Is the weather treating you guys well over there? No, no. The weather, the weather <laughs> hates us, and it's uh, it, well, it was it was snowy, then it was icy, then it was rainy, then it was icy, <laughs> then it was cold. So tonight's going to be really cold and icy, and that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm seeing as well. I'm uh, I'm just wondering if I should uh, venture out to even try to get the mail at this point, but we'll have to see how that no. goes. But no. <laughs> thanks, Oliver, for being here. Well, speaking of experts, we also have the man who has the pulse of enterprise and security, and he's also a senior analyst at Amdia. He's Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, welcome back. Uh, what's been keeping you busy? Well, the big thing keeping me busy is the fact that it's currently uh, 86 degrees and sunny. I just saw my neighbor walk past in board shorts and a T-shirt. Uh, so I am not worried about shoveling snow or slipping on ice. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, looking at the, um, the cybersecurity ramifications of a bunch of stuff going on in the world and trying to figure out what we can tell people uh, that's useful about how to try to keep themselves from uh, becoming roadkill as uh, tanks roll by. Right, right. Well, speaking of that, we were definitely going to get into that today as well. Um, so we should definitely get started. Now, we've heard about all that's going on in Eastern Europe. Um, Curtis just alluded to some of that. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're actually seeing both in cyber warfare and and just kind of the impact of that and the potential of that um, and the potential impact. Um, so we'll definitely get into that and have a good discussion there. Quantum computing promises to help businesses solve problems that are beyond the reach of the conventional high speed, high performance computer of today. Today we have Scott Buckholz. He's government and public service CTO and U.S. quantum leader from Deloitte. And we're going to talk about the trends we are seeing and the practices, applications, and the practical application of this advanced technology to some today's uh, issues and uh, problems out there. So we'll definitely get into all that coming up. So definitely stick around. But first, like we always do, let's go ahead and jump into this week's news blips. And with the rise of cyber threats and ransomware, organizations are doing everything they can to protect themselves. And if they can't make expensive changes, they sometimes look to cyber insurance as a way to fill the gap. Now, if you're wondering, the trend of cyber attacks to date, according to identity theft, th 
According to Identity Threat Research Center, there are 17% more publicly reported data breaches through September 30th, 2021 than in all of 2020. Now, IBM's cost of data breach report found the cost of data breaches increased from 3.86 million in 2020 to 4.2 million in 2021, the highest average total cost in the report's history. Now, the question is, what does this mean for cyber insurance. Well, in 2016, just 26% of insurance clients had cyber coverage. That number rose to 47% in 2020. And at the end of 2020, insurance policies jumped anywhere from 10 to 30%. Now, in the third quarter of 2021, the average cost of a cyber insurance premium climbed a record 27.6%, almost 30% there. Now, if the rates continue to rise, companies might decide it's not worth the cost. That is, if insurers continue to cover their industry. Aside from raising premiums, though, some insurers are reducing coverage from specific industries, including education and healthcare, limiting how much cyber coverage they offer or restricting contract terms. Now, some are extending standalone policies from cyber risk rather than build, uh, bundling it in with wider coverage. In fact, after 41% of cyber insurance claims pertained to ransomware attacks in the first half of 2021, many insurance companies began capping how much they'll reimburse for these attacks. There it is. They're actually starting to pay cap it. Now, if it may be, it may not be an ongoing solution for organizations anymore because of that. Now, another question we have to ask ourselves about cyber insurance is: Is cyber insurance fueling ransomware attacks? On the other side of things, right? Well, with the huge payouts, the data is showing that it is. However, having a payout ceiling. This means organizations may be forced to take more stricter measures to protect themselves. It also makes them less likely to pay out the ransom. Now, whether you choose cyber insurance or not, make sure you have security based basic security things covered. Like, for instance, in the use uh, the use of strong passwords and FA to, to kind of mandatory for employees. Make sure you're patching all systems and keeping security software up to date. Ingress and egress filtering is a must as well as network segmentation. You must also have protocols in place to recover data after successful cyber, cyber attacks. You run, run data breach exercises, in fact, educate employees on the latest threats and test your plan regularly to determine vulnerabilities and make changes as needed. Now, there's no such thing as 100% secure, but having these measures in place will give you the peace of mind. You should make it easier to obtain cyber insurance even as well focus on the security fundamentals of course not only to qualify for an insurance policy but to ensure it remains insurance and not your first and only line of defense well, jupiter one has announced starbase an open source tool for security analysts to collect information about an organization's assets and their relationships and pull them into an intuitive graph view for cyber asset management the graph data model, based on open source graph data platform Neo4j, makes it easier to see relationships between different assets and to perform complex relationship analysis. As a quick note, if you haven't yet begun to learn about graph databases and graph data, do yourself a favor and get started now. You know, security teams are tasked with protecting a rapidly growing number of assets, including systems with IP addresses, devices, cloud resources, traditional and software as a service applications, source code, network configurations, data, user identities, and access control rules from a dizzying array of threats. The challenge is compounded when dealing with transient environments where cloud and virtual resources change IP addresses, New systems are being added and removed regularly, and users are constantly moving. According to Jupiter One's president and CEO, Erkang Zhang, estimates that assets outpace employees 500 to 1 are pretty much reasonable. Included in that is the fact that organizations cannot defend what they don't know. Many security teams struggle to know what assets they have and poor visibility into how they relate to each other. Starbase will integrate with over 70 different systems that range from cloud service providers and source code control providers to internal developer platforms, vulnerability management platforms, and human resources platforms. Analysts can also query the data from the graph view, asking questions like, which user accounts represent my employees? Which of my employee user accounts have MFA disabled? And which of my source code control which of my source control repositories are accessible to outside collaborators? Starbase 
is available on GitHub. Uh, nonprofit cyber. So no, it's not a group of hacker volunteers doing counter hacking. Uh, nonprofit cyber is a coalition of nonprofit orgs that have joined forces to build awareness of the cybersecurity work they're doing and team up wherever it happens to make sense. Uh, nonprofit Cyber has 22 founding members. They include Global Cyber Alliance, the FIDO Alliance, the Center for Internet Security, uh, and even the uh, the Consumer <laughs> Reports. Uh, there's uh, along with 19 other organizations. They say they won't focus on lobbying, policy development, advocacy organizations, or industry associations. So that actually sounds like it might tick off some uh, government folks. But the uh, the group still earned a thumbs up from Jan Easterly, who's the director of U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security uh, for the, uh, so CISA, I believe. The organization's members view their alliance as a way to more easily collaborate on new projects, avoid unnecessary duplication of effort, and seek funding. Uh, if it holds true to its initial mission statements, it looks like the nonprofit cyber org will, will uh, pay more attention to championing technological solutions to security problems rather than throwing a bunch of money at elected officials in an attempt to influence their policies. All I can say to that is hallelujah. The EU is not shy from ensuring that organizations comply with data rules. We know that with GDPR alone was has caused a ripple effect across the industry. Well, the latest news means that companies will not have now have to make it easier to move data between software and services. The European Union unveiled new rules that will make it easier for users to transfer data generated from products like Amazon.com, Alexa, or even Tesla vehicle. Now, the European Commission's Data Act will set rules on how companies can access so-called non-personal data or data that does not contain any information that identifies an individual. The proposal will impact a wide variety of sources, including information collected in machinery and connected devices, such as smart home appliances. For example, under the new rules, the driver of the car of a car could request that any data generated on the performance of the vehicle be sent to a repair shop of their choice. This could help customers get cheaper services rather than being obligated to go directly to the car company, according to the commission. Now, let's think about this for a second. We talk about cloud vendor lock-in all the time and how it's hard because of data storage. Well, this may also mean cloud storage providers will need to make it easier for people to make sure they share their data as well. Now, how long do organizations actually have here? Well, the proposal will now go to the EU countries um, and the European Parliament for approval, but it can actually take years to go into effect. What we do know is this could also cause another ripple in the industry in favor of the user. Let's hope so. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Linode. Now, whether you're developing a personal project or managing large workloads, you deserve simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions. Now, with Linode, Build applications using a simple cloud manager API or CLI. Quickly scale up or down with standard VMs, dedicated CPUs, and enterprise-grade GPUs. Now, why should you choose Linode? Well, you'll get a support experience above the rest. People choose Linode because they demand a better customer experience. That customer support experience is very important. Now, Linode's independent and mission drive them to different standards where the customer is driving force behind everything they do. Now, they... Have pay-as-you-go, predictable and transparent pricing. Linode pioneered the predictable flat pricing model for cloud computing. No more anxiety over hidden costs. They make it simple to launch and scale in the cloud. With Linode, you'll get flat pricing across every global data center, an intuitive cloud manager, full-featured API, best-in-class documentation, and award-winning support. Linode makes it easy to manage your applications in the cloud. Now, Linode has proven secure and reliable enterprise-grade infrastructure with 11 data centers worldwide, extensive peering relationships, and their next generation network, Linode delivers the modern infrastructure and performance you need to innovate at scale. Now, whatever you want to do, they can do. You can host your website, build your app, store or backup media, easily launch and enrich your developer applications, hosted services, websites, AI and machine learning workloads, gaming services, or even CI, CD environments launch and scale in the cloud with their virtual machines. Plus you can choose shared and dedicated compute instances, or you can use your hundred dollars in credit on S3 compatible object storage, managed Kubernetes, and much, much more. Linode was rated the easiest to use by G2 crowd in 2021. That's why cloud developers choose Linode 
because they can make managing complex cloud infrastructure easy with simple bundled pricing, full featured API, and 100% human support. Linode helped pioneer cloud computing back in 2003, three years before AWS. So they have longevity, you know, you can trust. Develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and easier. Get $100 in credit. Visit linode.com slash twiat. That's linode.com slash twiat. And we thank Linode for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, we all know tensions continue to be mounted over in the Eastern European countries. Um, you know, we've actually seen a bunch of things starting to surface, a bunch of large surface areas of impact happening here. Now, on one front, we're seeing a lot of cyber warfare. We're seeing a steep trend there. The fears are, are being fueled by both um, a recent president and by the nature of the malicious activity directed at organizations in Ukraine over the past several months by cyber threat actors believed to be affiliated with the Russian government. Now, Russia has shown a tendency to use hybrid cyber warfare approaches. In fact, both kinetic and cyber in previous conflicts. And what's playing out currently is in line with that approach. Combined with the fact that Western nations have imposed those sanctions we've, been, we've heard about um, has left Russia with few options at the risk of being cut off entirely from the global financial systems. Now, much of the immediate concern is focused on a flurry of malicious activity targeted at Ukrainian organizations. We're seeing things like data wiping software against like the Ukrainian government systems and financial institutions. We are seeing BGP hacks, DNS warnings, DDoS attacks and traffic rerouting. It's no holds bar over there. Uh, and it almost seems somewhat random, but organized in the same sense. I want to bring my co-host here in a second to talk about that. Now, let's cover some of the immediate concerns that we're hearing about. Uh, hours before the Russian troops entered Ukraine, security researchers reported numerous uh, Ukrainian organizations getting hit with a sophisticated new disk wiping malware. In fact, ESET, which is tracking the threat, is calling it Hermetic Wiper. Instead, it found traces of the malware on hundreds of systems in Ukraine. Now, Semantic reported the malware being deployed against organizations in Ukraine's defense, financial, and aviation IT service sectors. Uh, the malware all appears to be designed solely to damage the MBR, the master boot record, on most Windows machines, making them unbootable and compromised. Um, now, we heard uh, there's also another similar disk wiping tool called Whispergate. Uh, and in fact, um, we've we've had that kind of been in comparison with 2017's not Petya, now, which is actually initially appeared to, to be ransomware that actually wipes your disk as well. So these are all kind of comparable and they're all kind of doing the same thing, but they're being used in this attack. Now we're seeing a lot of tens of thousands of machines infected worldwide um, and they're targeted mainly at Ukrainian systems. Now concerns are also high over at new malware framework called dubbed Cyclops Blink, that Russian threat actor Sandworm and AKA Voodoo Bear are actually using to target network devices. Now, Sandworm is the threat actor behind the Petya outbreak, uh, the 2015 black energy attack that temporarily crippled Ukrainian's power grid, and uh, the first ever fiber weapon developed specifically to target electric systems at scale. Now, a joint advisory this week from the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, the U.K.'s National Cybersecurity Center, the NSA and the FBI described Cyclops Blink as malware that... and as malware that Sandworm is now using as a replacement for its previous VPN filter to target network devices. In fact, VPN filter, filter infected some 500,000 routers worldwide, and Cyclops Blink has, was developed shortly after that in 2019. Now, uh, in keeping with previous patterns that we've seen in Russian military actions against Ukraine this week, we've seen numerous DDoS attacks targeting key government websites, including those of the Ukrainian par parliament and other entities, and a Russian link website that served as a command and control center for the attacks was also found as hosting clones of key Ukrainian government websites, including those of the president and the Ministry of Justice. There's a lot going on over there. seems like there's more and more every day. I want to bring my co-host back in um, and, and talk a little bit about this, what's going on. Um, obviously, we're seeing a lot of attacks going on in different parts of the sector. Obviously, websites, information sharing websites, we're seeing targeted uh, government systems. Um, obviously, it seems like tactics to create chaos in many different parts of the sector here. Uh, do we feel like uh, this will continue? Uh, where, where do we see this kind of impacting the Ukrainian government? Uh, uh, Curtis, I want to throw this to you. Well, the, the important thing to note that is that the... 
Um, the things that we're seeing are not specifically designed to create chaos. Ch chaos is the sort of thing. Uh, there are national actors who do that. Um, Iran is is noted for that just to sort of throw little chaos bombs into systems. You now, the stuff that we're seeing uh, being tossed at Ukraine is designed to cripple systems, uh, to deny uh, IT systems to uh, government and to the war fighters uh, for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it is the explicit uh, aim of this uh, particular exercise from the Russians to uh, enact a change in government of the Ukraine. Uh, so they are trying to cripple the current government. They are trying to deny them the ability to communicate amongst themselves and to their war fighters. Uh, we will almost certainly see more attacks sent against critical infrastructure, communications, uh, we've already seen attacks on their uh, 5G and cellular networks. Uh, there will be more against their power grid. Uh, and it is highly likely that we will see uh, attacks on other energy uh, systems as well. So these are, these are targeted. These are designed, as I said, to deny... Uh, the government and the military access to systems. Now, where things are going to get really, really interesting is if we see the same attacks sent against people perceived as being allies of the government, current government of Ukraine. Um, who might that be? Well, any member of NATO, uh, so that's almost all of Western Europe and the U.S., um, and, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is going to be if they pull a lot of the controls off of the malware. Most of these pieces of malware, if you look at them, they have controls embedded in the code to check and see essentially where they're running. Now, these can be fairly broad-based where they look at things like the language running on the system or the, uh, the class A IP addresses. Uh, to see what nation they're running in, um, pull those off, and they become tools that can be used against any system anywhere. Um, and if we start to see those controls being pulled off, that's when we'll know that we're moving to what amounts to cyber total warfare. Um, it won't surprise me if we don't get there fairly soon, and uh, that's when life gets entertaining for an awful lot of uh, organizations uh, across Europe and North America. Right. I think, I think it's good that you brought up the fact that this is not just going to impact the Ukrainian areas, obviously. Um, you know, we, we, in fact, um, we saw um, the director of cybersecurity infrastructure security agency, Jen Esterly, actually put out shields up warning last week, knowing that all organizations in the U.S. are also at risk. The question is, what should organizations be doing? at this point that they are not already doing. Oliver, what do you think? Uh, well, aside from what Kurt said, um, yeah, as at PC Mag, we got the press release from CISA, shields up. Um, you know, uh, I know I'm a little bit of a curmudgeon but, or a wise ass, but like that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, they did have uh, some steps you can take, uh, but if you read those steps, it's, you know, from a security professional's uh, perspective, that's business as usual. Just actually pay attention to what you're doing, right? So it's email security, it's MFA, it's data protection, it's uh, a, a decent disaster recovery plan that you've actually tested, right? You got, and you have to keep watching those things and monitoring those things on a much more frequent cadence, uh, at least until this is this is over. If it, you know, if it's over any anytime soon, if you don't do vulnerability testing in addition to actually deploying vul vulnerability patches, then you should probably start. Uh, base, but basically it's at least for the kind of people that read PC mag, my audience, which is medium to small business with well, small business, especially, but even medium to uh, larger business for us, that's, you know, a thousand to 5,000 employees that that kind of size business uh, is not a lot you can really do against the Russians. Plus you have to also think about, yeah, unless it's open warfare, 
is really not a lot of upside to the Russians jumping your business uh, while they're fighting the Ukraine. I mean, that's maybe that'll happen in the future. But right now, I don't think you have to lose lose your mind. That's just me. Yeah, I agree. I think I think it's interesting here. I think you said some some good things here is obviously pay more attention. So I, I like to point out a couple of things. Obviously, most organizations just have some kind of endpoint protection and anomaly detection. So that should help in some cases. That's number one. Number two is I like the fact that you're calling out, hey, be more aware. Um, and Curtis, I'm, I'm going to get your thoughts on this as well. Like this is kind of an education thing for users. Uh, people who are the targets for most of these attacks are usually social engineering techniques. Um, they're ones coming through email. They're ones coming through uh, files being downloaded. They're usually, uh, you know, weak passwords from users. So making them aware of this uh, and making sure that organizations enforce better policies is, is it's probably a place to start, don't you think? Oh, it really is. And, you know, as Oliver said, uh, in in a very real sense, the shields up warning, while it, it sounds very dramatic, um, it boils down to, you know, all that stuff we've been telling you for the past 10 years you should be doing in cybersecurity. Well, we mean it now. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, there, there's nothing new there. What what it does say is that you should be having new conversations, um, reinforcing conversations with your employees, telling them to to be serious about uh, watching where email is coming from. Uh, if they have any question about any um, attachment, uh, send it to the IT department. Let, let the IT de department open it first and send it back. Uh, this is not the time to be taking uh, great cyber adventures on your work PC at lunchtime. You know, don't don't go off and spelunking in the you know nether regions of the web. Um, and you know, in terms of what's new or what might be actually different, I would say a couple of things. One, this is a really good time to have a conversation with your software and service supply chain. Touch base with your MSSPs, with your cloud service providers, with your SaaS vendors to find out what they're doing and make sure that you are coordinating with them. Um, if you have good teams on your active domain maintenance now, this would be a fine time to be going through and double checking all of your permissions and your user lists uh, to see how many uh, of your users, um, of their permissions, and especially your admin users or super users, how many of those accounts might be years old? Um, you know, if if they belong to people who really should have received a gold watch by now, might be time to drop uh, the permission level. Uh, so again, good cyber hygiene. Uh, this is a time to maintain fabulous communications with all of your providers. And just be aware that, um, things are likely to happen. So, you know, have all of your response mechanisms uh, warming up um, and sitting uh, in a ready to deploy state. You, you don't want to be caught flat footed anytime this year. Now, one recent in, uh, thing that just came up, we've seen this a lot on Twitter and and some other forums that are out there on the web. And in fact, you just brought it up during before the show actually started is the, 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 the kind of the hackers wanted sign going up. Can you maybe elaborate on what's going on there? Sure. Well, we, we uh, just before airtime, I saw this, uh, that the government of Ukraine has put out a call for people around the world to join a, um, a cyber team to help defend them against uh, these incursions in cyberspace from Russia. 
Uh, they recognize that this is an area where, you know, they really can't have too many people defending them. So they've put out a global call. It's going to be interesting to see, A, who responds, and B, whether that response remains purely defensive. Um, yeah. Given the current um, piece, uh, you know, the current state of mind in a lot of places, it won't surprise me if they don't have a fair number of volunteers. And given the way that warfare is going these days, it will surprise me not at all if they don't turn some of that talent to uh, offensive measures as well as defensive. Right. Um, Oliver, I want to throw it to you last here. I think uh, Curtis brought up a good point. He said, don't have organizations and individual organizations you know, splunking or running out on the internet trying to find solutions right away. You know, obviously you, you talk to and, and, and kind of reach outreach to, to small, medium sized businesses. Is it the message not to go and try to try something new here or implement some new technology just so they, they can be more secure? Is this again, going back to your original approach of just keeping making aware, keeping aware and just try not to spend, you know, extra time and money trying to implement something new at this point. Well, uh, ironically, uh, we just finished our, uh, endpoint, uh, uh, testing our big endpoint roundup, right? So that's 10 products. And we talked to, to a couple of more. And one of the biggest trends we keep seeing is they keep packing more and more functionality, right? So EDS, I mm -hmm. think you mentioned it earlier in some context, that's a rising trend. Uh, Ziff Davis actually bought a company called Viper. And back when we looked at them uh, the first time, I think in 2019, 2020, they didn't have any. Now they, they're they pretty close to being very competitive, right? That's all that, th that they've been working on along with email security. But then you talk to the, the product managers of those companies, not just ours, but others. Uh, and they say one of the biggest frustrations they have is all that their customers want to hear about is how can we automate it? What's the fastest way we can get it out to the endpoint and just leave it alone? We just want to you know, flip a switch and forget that it's there, except unless something hits us. Uh, so yeah, if you want to do something new, why don't you dig into what you have? Because a lot of these systems have a lot more muscle under them than, than at least their product people think that their customers are actually using. You know, dig in. If you don't uh, know how to use your, your endpoints EDS system or intrusion uh, full on IDS, or I think somebody calls it XDS, whatever it's called, find out how that works. Take a class, do what you got to do, get that running. Right. If, uh, if, yep. if, it, if they, if they do SSO, if they do all these other things, find them, use them. You probably already have more than you think you do leverage your investment. Great. Great. That's great. Thanks Oliver. Well, I think that does it for that by, I'm sure that we'll continue to be talking about this in the weeks to come. Um, a lot more things coming up, uh, each and every day. So I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to it. Well, folks, it does it for the bites. Next up, we have our guests drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ride. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Hacker Rank. Now, between deadlines and frustrating interview tools that aren't set up for technical interviews, conducting a tech interview might be the last thing you have time for. Well, you have to spend the first 10 minutes of your interview just trying to set up an environment to share code from a dozen documents. This wastes you and your candidates' time. Well, fortunately, Hacker Rank has developed an IDE, Integrated Development Environment, just for tech interview process. Now, with a set of easy-to-use interview tools, you can quickly find the best developers for your technical projects. Now, the developer interview tools include a pre-made question library with 2,500 questions, so you'll quickly find the right questions for your coding needs. A, a code playback feature, so you can review the candidate's coding approach and score their skill levels. And a built-in whiteboard, so you can collaborate in real time to see how problems are solved. It's time to reboot your technical interview process with Hacker Rank. Click interview done. Now start using Hacker Rank for free today and see how much better a technical interview can be. It's time to reboot your technical interviews with Hacker Rank's easy to use tools. With a pre made question library, code playback, and built in whiteboard, you'll be conducting better technical interviews and instantly identifying the right talent. Go to hackerrank.com slash twiet. Start a better tech interview for free today. That's hackerrank.com slash twiet. And we thank Hacker Rank for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, this is my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twiet Riot. And today we have the CTO and government public services for Deloitte and their U.S. quantum leader, Mr. Scott Buckholz. Welcome to the show, Scott. 
Thanks for having me, Lou. Now, that is quite the title. I want to get into that in a second. But before we do, I think I want to get we normally start with our guests is our audience kind of loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short journey through tech and how it ended, how you actually ended up at Deloitte? Sure. Um, I actually started my career in technology as a frustrated youth. I wanted an Atari video game console back in the day. My father instead said, here's, a, here's an account on our mainframe. Here's a Fortran manual, write your own games. Um, so that was a long time ago. Um, but I sort of followed that trajectory for a number of years. And at some point after doing shrink wrapped software development for a while, I decided I wanted to actually talk to the people who had the problems that needed to be solved not just make up them. Uh, and so I found my way to consulting and from there I found my way to Deloitte. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, you know, I, I, I'm gonna be honest, I've actually heard you speak quite often because you talk a lot about tech trends. Um, and in fact, I, I, I followed your, um, the tech change report from Deloitte for a long time, many, many years. And, you know, they, they often, are quite right on the money. I can tell you that. Um, and I, I think that they're, you know, we're starting to see some trends uh, recently. Um, in fact, um, one of the topics we wanted to get into today is around quantum computers. Um, but, you know, your tech trends report just came out and I wanted to maybe just, just kind of high level quickly. Can you maybe give us a high level of like some of the large areas you're seeing trending in, in, in the enterprise? Sure. We, so our report, what we're trying to do is look 18 to 24 months just into the future for enterprise IT. And some of the big things we're seeing are better technologies for data sharing, um, more use cases for blockchain for real, um, things like um, you know more automation and technology, IT departments having to now think more about all of the physical technology. So that's everything from drones and uh, smart manufacturing equipment to French fry making robots. And what does all that mean? So there's a lot there. Um, and as I tell people, our reports are svelte 135 pages, but uh, there's a lot of great information. Right. I mean, I think some of the interesting things here is, you know, we saw we see a lot about um, you know, a lot of more, more of machine learning and AI integration to, to different uh, workflows. Obviously, we're seeing that kind of grow in the different parts of the market. Um, but one of the most interesting things, um, you know, that you've, you've covered and talked about before is quantum computers. Um, and I think mm -hmm. this is a interesting space because obviously they have a lot of potential. Um, they're exceptionally good at solving uh, and optimizing problems. Um, so to me, they're kind of limit, limitless in, in, their, in their problem solving, their potential. But the interesting thing is they're kind of in, still in their infancy stages. They're, they're, incredibly, they're incredibly expensive. Um, and sometimes those systems are plagued with problems. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the industry and where things are kind of starting to pick up? Sure. I think in a lot of ways, if you think about it, we're kind of in the equivalent of the 1960s when you look at quantum computers. They're, to your point, Lou, they're big, they're expensive, they fill rooms, they're kind of clunky. Um, and there are a bunch of competing technologies. So there are at least half a dozen different approaches. People have different ideas about where all this is going. And so if you think about what it might've been like in the 60s, there was a tremendous amount of excitement because people could see where this was going over time. And that's really where we are in a lot of ways. We're at this point where even though the capabilities today are uh, nascent, even though the capabilities today are just getting to the point for some of the specialized things that they can actually do as well or occasionally better than classical computing. In most cases, this is not stuff that people are going to be using tomorrow to plug into their enterprise workflows. Um, but if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can actually see the combination of engineering problems and research problems that need to be solved that are actually gonna make it so that everybody uses these things all the time. Um, you know, it's interesting because the, the 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 document that I was reading around the tech trends, you guys kind of break this up into um, maybe three or four promising areas for quantum computing. Can you maybe take mm -hmm. us through what those are? Sure. Um, we 
So when we think about quantum computing itself, there tend to be a bunch of different use cases. Um, the big classifications are the idea of quantum chemistry and quantum material science. So actually, if you look back, um, the original work, the suggestion by Robert Feynman was actually that you could use uh, the power of atoms to simulate other atoms. And that's really what we're talking about when we look at that uh, aspect of quantum computing. So the idea of being able to do better drug discovery, better um, materials research, better chemical development, all sorts of things in silico, as opposed to doing them in a lab. The second class of problems is really around accelerating machine learning. And there have been a lot of really promising advances where it may be possible in the future that quantum computers can do machine learning much faster than the computers of today. So arrive at the models much more quickly and then enable them to be utilized. And then the last space tends to be around sort of large scale data analysis and other things where people are looking at how do we use the, the capabilities, how do we use the, the theoretical power and today the real power in some cases to actually do uh, large scale mathematical modeling and data analysis and other things. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity in the space and if you look around, what you see is organizations in financial services, in pharmaceuticals, and a number of other places looking at these technologies for valuations, for drug discovery, for portfolio optimization, and trying to see you know, where is going to be the first places that we get um, actual uh, production value out of these tools and systems. You know, one thing we're obviously seeing worldwide, we're, so, a lot, we're hearing a lot about supply chain uh, issues and a lot of organizations are trying to figure things out. They're trying to, you know, write algorithms and models around, you know, uh, better places to essentially uh, find more resources or maybe more effective and efficient routes for drivers since they have less of them. Um, and obviously there are, seems like a lot of potential is there for quantum computing. Is that you're seeing that? if we kind of dive a little bit more into supply chain, are you seeing quantum computing applied in that kind of nature of things as well? Yeah, and just to make it more interesting, I mean, I told you there are half a dozen competing technologies. Um, there mm -hmm. are two big classes of quantum computers you'll hear people talk about. There are uh, the gate-based systems. These are considered the general purpose systems. They're the ones that the IBMs and Googles and Amazons and Rigetti's and IonQ's and others are working on. And then there are the quantum annealer systems. So Fujitsu and D-Wave and a number of others. It turns out it's annealers are actually these special purpose computers. They're really great at optimization. And people are already looking today to use uh, some of the annealers for optimization of things, not just supply chains, but also routing and a number of other problems um, and starting to see really interesting results. Well, folks, we have to take another great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Thanks to Canary. Now, if there's anything we've learned from the last year, it's that companies must make it a priority to layer the security of their networks. One of those layers needs to be Thanks Canary. Unfortunately, companies usually find out too late they've been compromised, even after they've already spent millions on IT security. Attackers are sneaky. Unbeknownst to the companies, they prowl networks looking for the vulnerable and valuable data. But the great thing about Canary that they have turned this into an advantage for you. Now, while attackers browse Active Directory for file servers and explore file shares, they will be looking for documents. They'll try to default passwords against network devices and web services, and they'll scan for open services across the network. Now, things canaries are designed to look like the things that hackers want to get to. The canaries can be deployed throughout your entire network, and you can make them look identical to a router, a switch, an NAS server, a Linux box, or a Windows server, so attackers won't know They've been caught. You can put fake files on them and name them in ways that get the hacker's attention. And you enroll them in Active Directory. When attackers investigate further, they give themselves away and you're instantly notified. Now, Canary also has Canary tokens and they act as tiny tripwires that you can drop into hundreds of places. Now, Canary is designed to be installed and configured in minutes and you won't have to think about them again. And if an alert happens, Canary will notify you any way you want. And you won't be inundated with false alarms. And you can get alerts by either email or text message on your console through Slack, webhook, syslog, or even just through API. Now, data breaches happen typically through your staff. And when they do, 
companies often don't know they've been compromised. In fact, it takes an on average 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. Canary solves that problem. A canary was created by people who have trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks. And with that knowledge, they've built Canary. Now, you'll find Canaries deployed all over the world and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Visit canary.tools slash twit. And for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrade, support, and maintenance. And if you use code twit in the Hattie Hear About Us box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love your thanks canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your canaries with their two month money back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the how do you hear about us box. And we thank things canary for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Mr. Scott Buckholds. He's the CTO in government and public services for Deloitte and U.S. quantum leader. We talk a lot about some of the trends we're seeing in the industry and, of course, quantum computing. But I do want to bring my co-host back in because they've been chomping at the bit, wanting to ask some questions as well. I'll throw it over to you first, Kurt. Kurt? Well, I appreciate that. Um, my first question is this. You know, we this is one of those things, in some ways, quantum computing is like nuclear fusion as a an energy source and lots of research lots of great promise to the technology but you know this is not a, at a point where you can typically just you know call up your very large computer company rep and say roll in a truck with a couple of quantum computers on it because i really want to see that running in my data center um, are we going to reach a point where lots of organizations have their own multi-qubit quantum system sitting in their data center, or are the environmental factors such that this is essentially always going to be someone else's computer that you're leasing time on? I think the origin of your question, Kurt, is because if you look at a number of the technologies, a lot of them operate at temperatures colder than outer space, and they require liquid helium on site and all sorts of other measures. And it is unlikely that the average organization is going to want to bother with that level of effort and investment. And in those cases, on some level, if those are the technologies that win, then I think we'll be all be leasing, well, the vast majority of us will be leasing time on somebody else's machine. What's interesting is there are actually a couple of technologies that operate using lasers and atoms and at room temperature. Um, some of them are even aspiring to create rack mounted server size systems. And so it is possible that at some point in the future, depending on which technologies actually work out the best or which technologies are actually best suited for certain purposes that you might actually be able to buy one of these machines and stick it in your data center. Um, the, the thing I will say though, is at the moment, um, I compare this a little bit to looking at a playground and trying to pick the Nobel prize winner from the kids who are running around. Um, I don't think any of us really know which ones are gonna work best just yet. I I appreciate your 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 honesty there, um, and, and I agree. It is interesting to see all the possibilities, and um, I think most of us in the industry have technologies that we sort of hope come to yeah. fruition in a big way. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether they do. Now, the other thing, uh, both you and I have heard all of these sort of apocalyptic predictions about what quantum computing means for security. You know, there, there, there is no current, currently widely available encryption, for example, that mm -hmm. can withstand a quantum assault. Um, given what we know about the state of quantum availability, um, how worried should the average organization be that their current encryption um, key-based technologies are about to be made obsolete by 
bad guys with quantum computers. Is this a rational fear compared to all of the other fears that they need to, to have uh, on their list of concerns? I think the so the first thing to to remember is the most optimistic estimations of when there will be a quantum computer that can break into people's existing encryption is five years. There are a lot of estimates where people say it's it's 10 years away, but it's not for tomorrow. And so on some level, Kurt, given the list of things that you could be worried about, um, as you all were speaking about earlier, this is probably not the top of the list. Uh, part of what's going on, I would say, is a couple of things. First, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, is working on identifying the standards that they uh, approve of that should actually be rolled out as quantum proof encryption. That is a timeline that is sometime in the next year or two. And what we can all reasonably expect is when that happens, we'll start seeing the migration for our uh, security in our browsers and other things to some of those new encryption standards over a period of time. The second concern sometimes that people have is this idea of data harvesting. So um, our uh, you know, nefarious actors in our systems today downloading terabytes of data so that, so that they can decrypt it at some point in the far future. Um, the thing I would say first is, one, um, this is certainly a possibility, but to your earlier discussion about data hygiene, none of those nefarious deed doers can do anything with data they don't have. And so good cyber hygiene is increasingly important. It's always been important. It just continues to be more so as time goes on. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is um, a lot of data doesn't actually need to be secured for another 10 years. If you think about credit card numbers, they rotate out in a period of time. What we actually suggest that organizations do is figure out, you know, how do we know what data we have? How do we know where it's located? How do we know how it's secured? And uh, how do we know how long we need to secure it for? If we have that inventory, it makes it really easy to prioritize what we're going to go fix and address and remediate at the point in time when the standards are available and the technologies are more mature. All right. Well, I, you're giving us some great answers, and I really appreciate that. And I'm going to um, to ask you to to walk a little farther out on a limb. I've been in this industry yeah. a very long time, and frankly, I am stunned at things like Raspberry Pis. You know, the the idea that you can stick a uh, a Linux server in a Mentos box is is just amazing to me. So, you know, when when do you think we have the possibility of a Raspi sized quantum computer, you know, something that we can carry around with us? Is this uh, is this in our working lifetimes or is this the sort of thing that uh, we leave for our children to enjoy the benefits from? Ugh. Um. Uh, you know, Kurt, the problem is the answer to that one might unfortunately be never. Um, if you if you look at some of the technologies that are the most able to be miniaturized, those are things like cold atoms and ion trap machines. Um, what you need is a piece of glass, uh, an incredibly complex set of lasers, a bunch of laser control equipment, um, you need readout equipment, you need a bunch of other things, you need a power supply. Um, if we get to the point uh, where all of that fits in a Bento's box in, in my children's lifetime, I will be astonished. But I guess I would also say I've been astonished at some of the things I've seen even in the past couple of years. So um, I'm not, How's this? I'm not banking on it, but I wouldn't uh, always trust my investment advice if I look at my portfolio. How's that? <laughs> 
Well, hey. I, I appreciate that, that honesty. And uh, with that, I'm going to let you off of my particular hook and uh, turn it back over to Lou. Lou, to you. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsch. Appreciate that. Well, I do want to put you on a different hook. I'm going to toss you over to Oliver now. Oliver? Hi. Uh, just want to say I love the phrase nefarious deed doers. Deed doers. I really like that one. <laughs> that was awesome. So I got a more practical you can one. That. Yeah, weirdly, PC Mag, I do get press releases about quantum computing. God knows why. Uh, I don't believe we're the target audience, but okay. Uh, I did have a question on uh, quantum volume. So mm -hmm. I get a press release from Google saying, hey, we're the hottest thing in the world. We have a 65 qubit quantum computer. And I get one from IBM saying, hey, we're going to have a thousand qubit computer by 2023. And aren't we computing gods for doing that? And then I get one from D-Wave saying, hey, you want to buy our 5,000 qubit uh, uh, quantum computer now? And I understand D-Wave is a specialist application, but yep. why exactly is their quantum volume count so different from like, how does that work? Um, they so they just have a different technology. They D Wave has what's called today what's called an annealer, and it is a um, it's it's a simpler device to build, and it's simpler in part because it does less things. It's a less generalizable thing. Fabulous for optimization, um, maybe not as fabulous for other problems. The quantum computers that IBM and Google and others are trying to build are these general purpose gate based systems that are going to be more like the computers we know today. And in that case, um, because it's a more technically challenging problem, it's just less easy to scale. And, uh, you know, D-Wave is also working on gate based approaches as well, or they've announced that. And so I think what we're going to see is a world where we have general purpose machines on one hand for lots of problems and then special purpose machines, you know, a little bit like the CPU GPU distinction, whether or not we want to solve uh, all problems, perhaps more slowly, or we want to solve a specialized class of problems much faster. Okay. Uh, and then just one other quick one. Uh, sure. And also, uh, again, back to, back to quantum volume. And by the way, uh, Kurt, it's obvious that the Illuminati have a fully functional Mentos-sized quantum computer run, running the world right now. Let's, let's just get that out there. Um, but getting, forgetting about D-Wave uh, and those types of specialist applications, the general purpose, Google, IBM, whoever, uh, quantum yep. computers, when would you, at what quantum volume would you get excited and say, this is, oh, we're, we're basically there? What's that number? <clears throat> um, I don't know. I don't know that quantum volume gets us entirely the answer we need. So here's here's part of the challenge. It's this intersection of not just how many sort of how much volume and other things do we have, but it's also what are the error rates? What are the gate resolution times? So what's the time to actually communicate between two atoms or two photons? Uh, what's the propagation time? What's the overall stability time of the machine? So if we are trying to do a complex problem and gate propagation is high, but fidelity time is low, we may not be able to get a deep enough circuit to actually solve the problems. And so I wish I could give you an easy answer for quantum volume. Uh, the challenge is if you look, there are a slew of engineering and research problems that people are trying to tackle at the same time. The engineering problems are the ones that are easier to look at and say, we can come up with a timeline to predict these. The cases where we need things that look a little bit more like research breakthroughs, those are the ones that are harder to predict. And unfortunately, some of the answer to your question, Oliver, is on the other side of a couple of these research breakthroughs in a couple of these technologies. And so I, I'm not sure it's as simple as quantum volume is a million and we're done uh, because of all the other factors. A million, okay. Sorry. Sorry. No, I'm disappointed, but okay. I like my, I like my, my, my single number solutions. I like that. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. How's that? There you go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. So one couple quick, quick questions from me, you know, this is more for the, the experimenter at home or even some of the, you know, the educators or even students out there who are trying to, to really kind of get into the quantum computer space. Is there, 
SDKs? Is there emulators? Is there a service that we can go and, and, and start building things on and learning things on that we don't necessarily have to have special hardware to do that, that type of thing? Absolutely. Um, the, so first of all, the first thing to recognize is that programming a quantum computer is actually a different thought process than programming a classical computer. There's no memory today. There's no state. Um, you're essentially configuring a problem and then asking the computer to solve it. So the first thing to recognize is it's not like you can go from, you know, I, I started writing Fortran. It's not easy to go from Fortran to programming a quantum computer and expect that that transition is going to be easy. There are some really great resources online and some great books that help people sort of think about that transition to get started. Um, so that would be thing one, right, is is uh, don't feel like you're gonna pick it up and it's gonna be obvious and intuitive day one. The second thing is, um, if you want, there are a lot, a number of really great simulators available. Um, IBM Kizkit is open source. They do a tremendous amount of work. There are a number of other frameworks. Um, there's Penny Lane, there's PyTorch, there's a variety of others. Many of them have simulators that accompany them. The simulators will run on your laptop, your desktop, in the cloud. It lets you basically try out uh, writing quantum code and seeing how it's going to run. It also lets you um, introduce simulated errors, so you get a sense of how that's going to work as well. And then if you're interested, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and some of the other cloud providers actually will uh, can give you access to uh, some of the quantum machines as well. IBM has a free tier of access that they will also give you. and so. As a student, as a sort of curious person who's getting involved, you can take advantage not just of the simulators, but when you get ready uh, and are interested in running things on actual quantum machines, you can get to those machines in a number of ways. Uh, it takes either some money or some patience or a bit of both, but all of these things are actually uh, pretty, pretty accessible these days. Fantastic. Well, I've definitely learned something today. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Thank you so much, Scott, for being here. But before we closed up, I did want to give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can learn more about Deloitte, maybe what it has to offer, maybe where they can find the Tech Trend Report. Sure. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, for those who are curious, dropping Deloitte Tech Trends in your favorite search engine will take you to our Tech Trends Report. If you're curious to learn about um, what we have to say about quantum computing or get in touch, you can drop Deloitte quantum computing in your favorite search engine. That'll take you to our Quantum Institute page. We've got a bunch of resources there, uh, a way to contact us. Uh, and my email is pretty much all over everywhere. So if you want to drop me a line, I'm happy to help you out or connect with me on LinkedIn. Thanks again, Scott. Well, folks, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible especially to my co-host. So starting there, very own Mr. Oliver Riss. Oliver, what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where could people find you? Oh, you can still find my work on uh, pcmag.com. I'm going to transition to mostly writing, which really agrees with me. Uh, <laughs> as far as the big stuff we're putting out next, uh, VoIP providers. I mentioned that last time. We're going to be putting uh, the results of that uh, those tests out, I believe, in the next two weeks. And that's that was a that was a lot of work getting that one done. So that's that's our next big milestone. That's it. We'll go for it. Thanks a lot, Oliver, for being here. We also have to thank everyone, Mr. Curtis Franklin as well. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where could people find you? Once I unmute myself, you can find me uh, at Omnia.com. You can find me uh, knocking around the Omnia page at darkreading.com. I tend to be uh, active on Twitter and on Instagram, uh, as well as LinkedIn. Uh, follow me on any of those places. I love to hear from members of the Twilight Riot. I'm always interested in hearing what you want to know about the world of enterprise security management. Drop me a line. Thanks a lot, Curtis. Thank you a lot for guys for being here. Definitely couldn't do show without you. We also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to listen to our show and get your enterprise and IT goodness. I want to make it easy for you to get your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now. 
twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and the links of the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your applications, every one of your podcast applications, because we're on all of them. And Listen on one of your devices because we can definitely be very broad and be available there as well. Subscribe because it's really the best way to support the show. Now, you may have also heard we also have Club Twit as well. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus fee, which is pretty cool that you can't get anywhere else. And it's only $7 a month. Now, one of my favorite things that also comes along with it is also the exclusive access to the members only Discord channel. I'm on it right now. A lot of amazing channels there, a lot of amazing channels and chat going on in the background. Uh, they're masters of the animated GIF out there. So definitely check it out and be part of the movement. Join Club Twit right now. Go to twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, also remember, they also offer Club Twit to corporate for corporate group plans as well. That's right. It's a great way to give access to your team. For to our ad free tech podcast, the plan starts with five members at a discounted rate of six dollars each per month, and you get as many seats as you like. And this is really a great way for your IT department, your developers, your tech teams, your sales team to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like the regular membership, you, you when you join, you get access to the Twit Plus feed as well as the Discord channel and server as well. So definitely check all of that out. Plus, it's time for the Twit audience survey. That's right. It's that time of year. The annual survey helps us understand our audience so we can make it better for you in the listening experience. So definitely check that out. It only takes a couple minutes and go to twit.tv slash survey 22 to take it. It's really easy and it gives us some great information. So definitely check that out right now. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with a gift of Twit because we talk about a lot of fun tech talk about tech tech topics on this show each and every week. So definitely give them the gift of Twyat because they will definitely enjoy it as well. Now, if you've already subscribed, you know, we're also available live. We do this live on the stream. That's right. Live at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays at live.twit.tv. Come see how the pizza is made. Come see how the show is run, the behind the scenes, all the banter and fun that we have here on Twit. So definitely come check that out live. And you can watch the show live. You can also jump into our infamous IRC channel as well, irc.twit.tv. There we talk, have some great characters in there. They're, they come each and every week. We have some new people. We have some reoccurring people. They are just great people in general. And we also have some great content that comes from them and some great discussions and always great show titles as well. So that's where most of our show titles come from. So thank you guys for all that support. So definitely check out the IRC channel, irc.twit.tv. Definitely hit me up at twitter.com slash Lou MM. There I post all my enterprise tidbits. You can direct message me for show ideas. I love having those conversations. In fact, I just had a great conversation with somebody today. They're in auto, automotive technology in Germany for BMW. Had some great conversations about what they do and all you know, they, how they design some of the interface services and things in the BMWs. Really great conversation. Just definitely hit me up. I love having conversations like that. If you were interested in what I do during my normal work week at Microsoft, definitely check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post our latest and greatest ways to customize the office experience. Check out Office Script. It's our newest and latest, greatest way to create macros that run on the web. That's right. Now you can have your Excel spreadsheets that are in the web. You can also have some JavaScript code that was recorded by you, executed at scale. Um, in fact, you can even run with Power Power Automate. So check that out. It's the latest and greatest ways to customize Office. Now, I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do this show without them. So thank you, Leo and Lisa, for all their support over the years. I want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. Couldn't do the show without them. Also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi as well. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the bookings and the plannings for the show, and we really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support. He's lurking in the chat room in the background there. He's always has some great topics and, and uh, things he, have to, he has to say. So thanks, Chibert, for being there. Now, before we sign out, we have to thank our editor as well, Mr. Anthony. Thank you, Anthony, for all your support, making us look good after the fact. Plus, our TD for today, he is the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt. And does an amazing and fabulous show called Hands On Photography each and every week. I learn something about photography every week from him. Um, and what's going on this this weekend in Hands On Photography? Well, Mr. Lou, this week 
I took a look at some images from the Loyal Hands-On Photographer listeners. Uh, it was Ooh. our Sunrise Photography Challenge. So a bunch was sent in, and I grabbed a few to talk about on the show and share my two cents and uh, just spread the love of the show in the community. So, yeah, check us out, twit.tv slash hop. Awesome. Yeah, Sunrise <laughs> Photo Photography is not easy. Nope. It's, uh, you know, one of those things, you know. <laughs> There's a, definitely check that out because I'm uh, – I'm not very good at it, so thanks, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. The world is changing rapidly, so rapidly, in fact, that it's hard to keep up. That's why Micah Sargent and I, Jason Howell, talk with the people making and breaking the tech news on Tech News Weekly every Thursday. They know these stories better than anyone, so why not get them to talk about it in their own words? Subscribe to Tech News Weekly, and you won't miss a beat every Thursday at twit.tv.